I was pointing it at that. Well, good morning, one and all. Good morning. Welcome to worship. I think I'm so great over air conditioning because holy cow, but you get even more hot and humid outside. I don't know. I said one to cry, but I'm sure glad we're in here. Thank you all and all, one and all for being present with us here in worship, whether you're joining us in person or online. We are so glad that you're here. We want you to know that no matter who you are and no matter where you happen to be on your journey, you are very welcome here. This is a special occasion today in the life of our church, and that is that not only do we get to celebrate the sacrament of communion with one another, and those of you at home may want to grab uh, some bread and some juice or water to have on hand to celebrate communion with us, but we'll also have an opportunity to offer our and express our appreciation for two longtime members of our congregation, both of whom have been active lay leaders, uh, Pat and Mike W. And uh, they are moving away from us. Uh, we're sad about that, but they may still be joining us online worship. Um, so that's pretty special too. All right, uh, so that's all part of our worship service today. There's something we love to affirm whenever we get together for worship, and that is to affirm God's goodness. Sometimes it's in the affirmation that it becomes more true for us. So let's do that. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Oh, do it again. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Amen and amen. And now our Deacon Jean is going to lead us in the response of call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Please join me in the call of worship. Into the blur of you. Excuse me, let me start over. Into the blur of our distractions and worries. Something bright and bold is shining. When we feel lost or confused, a voice calls us to follow a different path. Listen, there's another way that leads to abundant life. When we're anxious or discouraged, Christ invites us to discover an amazing treasure. Turn around and get ready to be surprised. Come and receive nourishments for your journey from the one who provides for our every need. Let us praise and worship God. Our opening hymn is Praise and Thanksgiving. Uh, it is to a very familiar tune. Many of you know it, uh, the tune as morning has broken. And uh, we are going to be as with all of our worship, um, we're going to have this hymn being played by a recording because, as I mentioned to some of you, heard, Lori uh, W. normally would have been playing for us, um, has tested positive for COVID. So she made recordings of all the music. God bless her.
Beloved people of God, hear this wonderful good news. Be assured of this. God's love heals and God's grace sets us free. We not only trust in God's forgiveness, we trust the one who returns to us again and again to embrace, nourish, and empower us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, we only have one reading from Scripture this morning. And uh, I know that Reverend Kara is one of our readers. Ted is one of our readers, apparently. And uh, part of my problem is, yes, Joe, I'm sorry. I forgot to print the thing. And <laughs> I have been searching desperately in my email for your email. And all I have is something that Kara responded to. And I don't know. It's... Anyway, our reading from Scripture this morning is coming to us from Luke chapter 12. Verses 22 through 34. And uh, I am the first person reading. Okie dokie. I am the first person reading. And joining with me is also Ted R. and Reverend Kara. Do we have any other readers? Gene H. Gene H. She didn't know she was reading. So if you're going to, I can actually go in. Oh, okay. So I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> All right, well, that's you know that. Okay, so 
I'm going to invite my readers to come and stand by me. Okay, so come stand by me, fabulous readers. Okay, because we're all going to come into this microphone. So we're going to hear Jesus offer some really important words of uh, instructions to all of us about not worrying and not being afraid. So I'm starting it off. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? And consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor nor uh, can be. Spin. Spin. <laughs> Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink and do not keep worrying for what you are to eat and what you are to drink and oh my goodness i'm so sorry yes yeah i'm sorry i can't see it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things and your father knows that you need them Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Amen. <laughs> the Spirit was speaking. Well, so when I read this passage, I was, we're singing. <laughs> I taste our <our> over. <laughs> that we did really be getting <laughs> We're going to be singing, be thou my vision. Let me just pull up the recording. We'll get there in just a minute. Oh. 
entitled, The Demon, the Desert, and the Wardrobe, I don't know to what extent you can see this photograph of a huge, almost inconceivably large mound of clothing. And this mound of clothing has found its way into uh, the Chilean high Arizona, the high desert. In fact, uh, news about this first broke in November 2021, when Al Jazeera published an article exposing an environmental problem plaguing Chile, excess clothing waste. The country receives a whopping 59,000 tons of clothing from Europe, Asia, and the United States every year. Their, the garments begin their journey through Latin America at the port of, and I'll probably say this wrong, I apologize, Iquique, which sits in a free trade zone of northern Chile. From here, all that clothing can take three different paths. Some clothes may be bought by merchants from Santiago, the country's capital. Others will likely be intercepted by smugglers who will distribute the clothes to other countries in Latin America. But it's the third path that is so bleak. Garments that cannot be sold, whether due to prior wear or damage sustained before or during transport, are dumped in the Atacama Desert. And it is an extraordinary sight. The problem is that the global garment industry produces between 80 billion and 150 billion garments a year. Just think about that. 80 billion to 150 billion garments. Now, last I checked, I don't think we have more than 10 billion people on this planet. Anybody know about how many billion we have? Seven and a half. Seven and a half, seven and a half billion. Okay. Every year, we're producing enough for everybody to have plenty of clothes, a total excess of clothes. And what they said, of these clothes that are produced every year, nearly three-fifths of them are incinerated or discarded in landfills within a few years of being made. And what's so upsetting is that so many of these garments are not made from natural fibers, right? So. And many of them, even when they are made with natural fibers, were treated with chemicals at the time of the production or are synthetic made of polyester and other plastic fabrics. And here's the thing. 
As they degrade, toxins seep into the ground, contaminating soil and injuring surrounding animal and plant life. Can you even believe that? That's just from the garment industry, and it's from all of us making the garment industry think that they need to produce so many clothes because of this thing called fast fashion. That we could go out and get whatever the latest trend is, and it's all right if a few months, a couple of years from now, we don't need that clothing anymore. Now we have a way of recycling clothing here at the church um, by making things available to our neighbors. But the vast majority of our clothes aren't reused, right? The vast majority of them are, are taken and just pitched, as we've just heard, incinerated or dumped in landfills. What if instead of always being concerned with what we wear, as Jesus says, we recognize that our desire for having new clothes could actually be contributing to some of the really big problems in our world today. Well, there's something else that uh, Jesus talks about, and that is he mentions how we should also not be uh, worried about um, what we eat. I and mean, think about the ravens. And, hey, those ravens, they have what they need to eat. They don't build barns and so on and so forth. And yet, did you know that since 1970, we've lost 30 million birds? That's a lot of birds. He also talks about how there's plenty of, of uh, food to be had in the wild. The lilies of the field are dressed in beautiful colors and, and that there's plenty for the birds to eat. And yet I just found out, I don't know if any of you have watched um, uh, Sir Richard Attenborough's uh, program that's been on PBS about uh, plants. And, and I just found out that two-fifths so somebody who does math, is that 40, 40, 40%, 40 I thought it would be, two-fifths or 40% of the plant species around the globe are in danger of extinction. Well, so something needs to shift. And maybe there's something to what Jesus is teaching us, even though his context for this teaching was some 2,000 years ago when there wasn't anywhere near kind of environmental devastation that we see today. Well, I want to get back to what he said about not worrying, not being afraid. These are instructions that aren't exactly easy to follow, are they? Fear is a normal part of the human experience, and it does have its uses. But it can really get in the way forging the kind of trust that is essential to vibrant, life-giving faith. Like rust, fear can corrode not only our capacity to trust in God's promises, but also our ability to notice and appreciate when, where, and how God is at work in our lives. Now, we've all got worries, and I want to make a distinction here between worries, and the mental health challenge of anxiety. Because everybody has worries, but not necessarily everybody struggles with anxiety. And oftentimes, anxiety is like worry on steroids. And it's the sort of thing that can take over and consume one's thought processes to the point where you actually need some chemical rebalancing in your brain through some medication help. But all of us, regardless of whether or not we struggle with anxiety, we all have worries. And our worries are expressions of our concerns about the things or the people that matter to us, right? We also worry about what we can't predict or control. We worry about what might be, what the future might look like, and what already is. Circumstances that trouble us in the here and now. We worry about our finances, our jobs, 
our health, our loved ones. We worry about change. We worry about loss, loss of independence, loss of mobility, loss of health, loss of job, or even loss of home. We worry about big things like climate change. Some of you may be saying, yeah, now you've given me another thing to worry about, the global climate body, the global garment industry. Uh, but we worry about gun violence and inflation, possibility of a recession, the direction our country's headed in, the profound divisions that are tearing us apart. And how will we ever manage to bridge them? We worry about what others think of us, what choices we'll need to make. The thing is, worries about our future and our world can eat away at us. They can be, in their own way, like a lens that not only narrows our vision, but gives us tunnel vision, so that we only see what we're afraid of. And we can't see other things that may be present that could actually be helpful to us. And though we may intellectually agree with the idea of relying on God to take care of us, trusting in God's goodness and support to be present with us when we encounter challenges, and trusting that we are not alone no matter what our circumstances are, we may intellectually hold on to that. But deep in our hearts, we struggle because in practice, we often find it easier to rely on our own efforts than to look for how God's generosity and provision is actually present around us. And like I said, worries, they can provide that tunnel vision that can make it really hard to see how God is at work. Now, in my sermon last week, I talked about the lie of scarcity and its supporting toxic myths. Myths distinguished by author Lynn Swift in her book, The Soul of Money. And these myths are these. One, there's not enough. Two, more is always better. And three, that's just the way it is. I mentioned how just about everything in our society supports this lie of scarcity. Not enough, more is always better, that's just the way it is. And that that can leave us feeling like we're stuck on a hamster wheel endlessly trying to get whatever it is that we think is lacking in our lives. But there's an antidote to this toxic and depleting way of looking at our lives and our world. We can generate something far more powerful and empowering. <coughs> Bless you. And that is the experience of sufficiency. Again, here's how Lynn Swift puts it in her book. By sufficiency, she says, I don't mean a quantity of anything. It isn't a measure of barely enough or more than enough, <laughs> sufficiency isn't an amount at all. It's an experience, a context that we generate, a declaration, knowledge that there is enough and we are enough. Sufficiency, Lynn Twist says, resides in each of us. And we can call it forward. It is an intentional way of choosing how we think about our circumstances. Sufficiency, she says, is an act of generating, distinguishing, and making known to ourselves the power and presence of our existing resources and our inner resources. In other words, sufficiency is a conscious choice to look around us and within us, within our very being, with the expectation that we will find what we need 
for whatever situation we face. As Lynn Swift wisely points out, in the nourishment of our attention, our assets expand and grow. As we're saying more than once, in the nourishment of our attention, our assets expand and grow. This is what Jesus is trying to help us understand in what he's telling people about don't worry about what you're going to wear. And yes, he's not only talking about the craziness of fast fashion and buying more than you need. He's talking about what is the thing that drives us to be concerned about what we wear. It could be our worry about how others perceive us. Remember, back in Jesus' day, clothes were a marker of your identity, of your role in society, whether you had respect or didn't have it, whether you had the capacity to make decisions for yourself and your life, or whether you were at the mercy of others. So for him to say, don't worry about what you're going to wear, to trust that God will provide you with what you need, is a way out of that sense of scarcity that I don't have enough. I don't have enough of other people's high opinion of me. I don't have enough of, of clothing that makes me feel like I'm respected. You have enough because in God's eyes, you are enough. Now, one of the places we can really get sucked into worrying about not having enough it's about our own congregation, right? We can be, oh, we don't have enough young people. Oh my goodness, we don't have enough money. We've got this aging building. We don't have enough energy amongst our people. Folks are getting older and they want to relax and have other people step forward in leadership roles. We have people who are moving away for heaven's sakes, not just you, other people too. <laughs> And so there's this sense we can get sucked back in when we look even at our own church into this feeling, this lie of scarcity. Not for nothing, I got in my email uh, something from Horizons Stewardship that had done a um, survey, just an informal survey, asking a variety of churches that they had a contact information for um, to talk about the difference between 2021 and where they're at in 2022, about a few different things, church worship attendance, church giving, and uh, changes in their annual ministry funded. And here's what they discovered that was pretty extraordinary. And that was that 49% uh, of churches, 49% of churches, reported a decline in worship attendance in 2021 and 2022. And that for churches um, like ours uh, that, that uh, were our, in our particular giving range, why am I not finding this? I thought this was on this page. Hold on just a minute here. Um, yes, okay, so of those who have budgets, annual giving budgets, similar to what we have, annual ministry budgets like what we have, between 100,000 and 499,000, 53% said that uh, they were declining in worship attendance. So we're not alone in that some of these measures we have traditionally in the past used to say, hey, is the church thriving? Or is a church kind of on the downward spiral? They may seem to point us in a particular direction. But I also wonder how much of that is coming from the question of what do you have that's limited to finances and worship attendance? Because there's a lot more that's present, folks, in a congregation than just money and how many people show up to a worship service? What if we were to take the approach that Lynn Swift suggests, and that frankly Jesus is pointing to in his past, our passage from Luke, 
And that is to say, wait a minute, instead of worrying about what's lacking, what do we see that is here? Of what do we have enough? In fact, what does it mean for us to put our attention in a way that nourishes some of the assets that are here that may be going out of our mind. I mean, they're not even present. It's like how that those worries, that fear of scarcity, how that can just tunnel our vision so that we don't see some of these other things. The truth is, one of the ways to loosen that stranglehold of worry is to start being on the purposeful lookout for the resources already present. Whatever your circumstances may be, whether it's in your own life or whether it's in the church's life, the truth is we all have enough and we all are enough to cope with whatever challenges emerge. We have all kinds of resources that aren't necessarily dictated by dollar signs, right? We have our own capacity to grow and learn from experiences that we have. We have our own knowledge uh, from things that we have lived through in the past that can help us to face present circumstances. We have our own capacity to reach out and work and collaborate with others. We also, amazingly enough, have resources, all of us, regardless of our financial circumstances, the chances are we don't even know. I remember reading in, in a book that I've shared with you in the past, and I'm sorry it's not coming to my head at the moment, but it was about a congregation, well, specifically about a pastor who had served two different congregations, both had come from the place of thinking that their ministry needed to be about doing things for their community. Saying, hey, there's this need, there's this lack. And so now we're going to fill that lack. Okay, there's, there's not enough food, so we got a food pantry. Um, there's not enough uh, clothing, so we're going we're to have a clothes closet. And yet in doing that, they were not able to recognize what gifts are actually present in the people we see as somehow being deficient, right? So this author talks about, at least in one congregation, how they hired somebody who's a member of the wider community to kind of go around and get to know people in the wider neighborhood, get to hear what they're about, and frankly, be someone who's on the lookout for gifts that often went unnoticed. One of the things that this church ended up doing was taking some of the different uh, young people in the wider community and putting on special dinners, like banquets, for each of these young people, inviting friends and family to come. And the whole point and purpose of this was towards the end of the banquet, they had different people in that young person's life step forward and say, these are the gifts that I see present in you. This was transformative for these kids. Many of them had struggles in school. You know, maybe they weren't uh, super good at taking tests or they weren't really awesome at reading or math or whatever else. But people who knew them and valued them were able to reflect back to them what that value is. Another way of flipping things on the head of you aren't enough, much less you don't have enough. What if that were to be our approach? Not just to how we do ministry together, but how we look at our own lives. What if all of us were out there as people who were searching for the gifts that are present all around us, but particularly paying attention to what is valuable in each person we encounter every day? So many of our worries come from our own isolation and from that tunnel vision that we can establish for ourselves. But there is a way out of that restrictive way of looking at the world. There is a way that will set us free from the three toxic myths of there's not enough 
War is always better, and that's just the way it is. And we have the power to make the choice each day to say, what is good, what is present, where is God at work, and to call that out and help others to see it too. Do you understand how transformative this could be for our world? Oh my gosh, this is how the kingdom of God comes. It's through small but powerful actions, like creating a different way of seeing for yourself and speaking the good into a world that's all too full of all that's wrong and all that's missing. So yeah, I started things out on somewhat of a bleak note about that clothing situation. But I bet you there are all kinds of creative ways we could tackle that, at least in our own congregation. Not only by sharing with our neighbors, but maybe by even having clothing swaps. Lots of different ideas that we could generate. As far as ensuring that some of those plant species don't die, well, Jesus tells us that they can be our teachers because through them we can learn about collaboration. And that same um, special that, um, uh, that Sir Richard Attenborough was, was uh, narrating, I learned about the swallow uh, cactus in, in the Arizona desert, the Sonora desert. And if anybody says, what the heck are those? Those are the ones that are like the iconic you know, they have a branch like this and this and a large central column. And what I learned is that they rely on, I think it is it the, no, it's a mesquite. They rely on a mesquite tree as a nursery tree. Why? Because when they are little bitty growing slowly swarm cacti, they can easily be overcome by the extremes of temperatures that can happen in the Sonora Desert. And the, both the shade from the extreme sun and the branches of the mesquite trees' capacity to kind of moderate should any snowfall come and also provide kind of a, a shelter from really cold winds in the wintertime and at night, that helps them to grow up and helps them in turn to become a home for all kinds of creatures, birds of the air, to provide uh, nourishment and much needed water to many other creatures. There is a working together, a mutuality and a cooperation that happens in so many of the plant species. We can learn from them, Jesus says, how we too can collaborate how we can recognize gifts we each bring that together can create something larger that any one of us can do on our own. So really, folks, there is a way that we don't need to worry. Even someone like myself who struggles with anxiety, there is a way that we don't need to be afraid. But it does require each of us undergo a change in thinking and a change in seeing. That's a transformation that will heal our world. I can't wait to hear what you all start to notice in your life by making that conscious choice to look for where God is at work, where gifts are present, and where there are resources that previously you've never even noticed. Thanks be to God, who indeed provides us with exactly what we need each and every day. In our prayers this morning, we will have an opportunity uh, for both people here in the congregation, uh, in uh, Margaret Chapel, as well as the congregation online on Zoom to unmute themselves um, will be invited. First, we'll have the congregation uh, share prayer concerns as well as uh, share their joys and thanksgivings, and then we'll invite those of you on Zoom. Yes, ma'am. September 6th, I'm going to have a 
Okay, and then that's coming up on September 6th, you said? Okay, all right, Patty, we'll definitely uh, hold you in prayer. And I'm just looking here. I'm going to do the Ah, there we go. Well, let us all be together now in the spirit of prayer. Holy and loving God, it is a gift to know that we are enough and we have enough to meet whatever challenge we face. That we don't have to buy into the lie of scarcity. But God, this is such a countercultural thing to do to look with the eyes of possibility, to notice what so often goes unnoticed. And so we ask, God, that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, and open our minds to the gifts that surround us, to the goodness that is present, and to the resources that often go beneath our notice. God, in your mercy. Yeah. Holy One, we know that there are numerous challenges in our world that cry out for our attention, that are in need of our energy and our commitment and our desire to create something different. We pray for more favorable weather, God, and especially for us to have some rain. We know that we are in a mild drought right now here in Dutchess County, and we know how that affects farmers, never mind our own yards. And so, and it affects our insect population, which affects our bird population, and so many other things. So, God, we pray for nourishing rain. We pray for the good fruits of the earth to still be manifest. And we pray for all those who labor on our behalf to ensure we have food to eat. God, in your mercy. We also pray, God, for those who, because of a wider society, so convinced that some people will have more than enough and other people won't have enough, that they go hungry, that they go without safe, affordable housing, that they struggle to find meaningful employment and a living wage. We pray for all of these people and for all of us to find new ways to address what so often feels like insufficiency. God in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those among us who do struggle with illness of mind, body, or heart. Those who struggle with anxiety or depression, for whom worry is the mildest form, and yet may also be struggling with feelings of loneliness, isolation. We pray for those who are struggling with addiction and so often feel as though they are on their own and they are stuck. That you would bring liberation in their own capacity to recognize that they are cherished and valued by you and others in their lives. We pray for those who may have experienced a diagnosis that may be frightening, those who are facing surgery, um, those recovering from surgery. We particularly pray for Cheryl B, who will be having surgery tomorrow, or a surgical procedure tomorrow uh, for kidney stones. We pray for Joe M and his wife, Susan. Joe who's now in rehab, but had some unexpected health challenges that landed him in the hospital, and who may be feeling a bit discouraged. We pray for Lori W. and Char R. 
coping with COVID-19. For Cheryl N, continuing her journey of recovery from surgery. For Jean C, that she will continue to have energy and health as she also looks forward to surgery, to our surgical procedure. For Lee S and Walt J, for Kathleen G and her uh, cancer um, fighting, for Reverend David H and his wife Anne, for Barbara M's grandniece Nicole R and friend Gary R, for Bob M and the whole family that we gathered yesterday for the whole Martinez clan um, birthdays. And for Mike S and Patty B, for Betty A C, Bob H, Ha T, Don L, and Scott B, as well as for Vitalia, Sasha, Evelina, and Abby Nadine. God in your mercy. And now we open up uh, to prayer here in our gathered folks in Margaret Chapel. What are the joys and concerns we want to share with God? We know we pray for our own Patty B, who uh, is facing surgery to remove uh, some cancerous uh, growth um, on her body and is concerned, of course, about that. God, in your mercy. Yeah. Holy and loving God, it is a gift indeed that we can always turn to you and we can share those things that weigh heavily on us, um, those burdens that we need to let go of, those concerns we have and our worries. And we know that we can also share our gladness and our gratitude and our joy. The best part, God, is we don't even have to always have the words to express these things. We simply need to make ourselves aware that we are in your presence. We want to share what matters to us with you. And you hear us, and your power working within us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. For this, we are so deeply grateful. And we ask now that you help us to find new insights, new wisdom, new guidance from those very familiar words Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. It is such a gift to know that we are enough and we have enough to share. In fact, one of the ways that we start to have a different sort of relationship with the many different resources that are present in our lives, moving away from, oh, there's never enough, and more is always better, and that's just the way it is, is to say, wait a minute, no, I, I actually have a variety of things. But, not only are intended for me, but can make a huge difference when I share them with other people. Whether that's our time, our attention, our energy, our curiosity, our capacity to listen and be of help and of service to one another. And yes, our treasure. All of these are things that we have and we have in ways that can make a difference when we share them. So it's a spiritual practice every time we gather to worship to intentionally share what we value. And by doing that, to discover how much more is still present in our lives. So in fact, when we uh, share our treasure, you can uh, do that in one of three ways to support the ministries of this congregation. You can write a check and mail it to the church office 269 Mill Street, Poughkeepsie, New York, 12601. If you're here in Margaret Chapel, we have two offering boxes, uh, one in the back and one here as you uh, exit. And also, uh, if you happen to be uh, joining us um, 
online, you can go to our website, opentogod.org, and make a contribution by debit or credit card. Just scroll down on that homepage until you find the don donate online button. And if you have online banking, that's always another way too. But know that whatever you have and whatever you choose to share, there's a way in which when you put it all together, it multiplies to do God's work in the world. And now Lori has very kindly made a beautiful recording of a piece of music by Massenet, and we'll listen to that momentarily. I invite you now to join with me in a unison prayer of dedication. Let us pray together. Life giving God, by faith we know that we are enough to make a difference in our hurting world, and we have enough to share. We dedicate this offering to your purposes and to the ministry of this congregation. Through sharing what we treasure, may we discover a new joy of generosity, the blessing of deep faith, and the courage to partner with you and others in the work of restorative justice. In the name of Christ, our faithful shepherd, we pray. Amen. This table, this table that gives us a taste of the great banquet, the great banquet of blessing, of sufficiency, of everyone having enough and being able to join together in joy as Christ's special guests. This table is not one where we dictate who gets to come and eat. It is a place open to absolutely everyone, where you can come if you have some worries. You can come if you've got some doubts. Come if you have questions. 
you can come and find a welcome place, no matter where you happen to be on your journey, because it is here that Christ says you belong. Would you please join with me in the responsive communion prayer found in your bulletin on page four? May the God of priceless blessings be with you always. And also with you. Open your hearts to the one who fills us with new life and hope. We open our hearts to the light of love and shine through us. Let us give thanks to God who heals us and sets us free. It is our joy and delight to honor thanksgiving. Truly, we can learn from the birds and the plants of how God does provide enough for all to have what they need in balance and in cooperation. And at this table, we recall that night that while it was to end in a lot of pain and sorrow, with betrayal of trust, with arrest, and with imprisonment. Jesus gathered the very same people who would let him down so spectacularly. And he took some ordinary things they were likely to find whenever they gathered to eat in the future. Bread. And he said for this bread, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat of it, do it to remember broken and coming whole. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took a cup and giving thanks for it. He gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant, the new relationship, which is created through my blood. And it's all about forgiveness. Remember how those people would let them down? He gave them a way to remember forgiveness is part of our relationship with God. As often as you drink of this, Remember that forgiving love that is always available to you. Would you please join with me now in the spirit of prayer? Holy and loving God, we remember that you have been part of creation's story from the very beginning, bringing forth light out of darkness, stars, and planets. You brought forth life on this earth, and in the fullness of time, you chose to come and be among us as one of us, to show us what fullness of life truly looks like, to remind us that we are enough and we have enough to transform the pain and suffering that exists into opportunities for connection, belonging, and even rejoicing. And so we ask through the power of the Holy Spirit that you would pour out your blessing upon these gifts of juice and bread so that they may nourish our hunger for completeness and fulfillment, so that we may be fed with all we need to go out into the world to do your work. So that as we eat and drink, God, we may taste and see your goodness. That we may take into our very bodies some of Christ's spirit, some of his incredible love for us. All of this we pray through the power of Jesus' name. Amen. We have an opportunity this morning for you to receive communion from our deacons. I believe Jean and Marilyn will be distributing communion this morning. 
They will be serving each of you individually with um, uh, some silver tongs to for the bread. We invite you to eat the bread as you receive it. And they will also be serving you a cup of juice, which uh, we will hold on to and uh, drink together. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste, and experience God's goodness. Forgiveness and love for all. Let us join in the unison prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Thank you, God, God for life in the spirit of Jesus, for gladness in this reign of God, for love that cannot die, for peace the world cannot give, for joy in the company of friends, for the glory of creation, and for the mission of justice you have made our own. Give us the gifts of this holy communion, for oneness of heart, Love for neighbors, forgiveness of enemies, the courage to do your will, and the fullness of abundant life. Send us out to bear witness to your transforming presence at work in the 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, now we have an opportunity to acknowledge, appreciate, and uh, offer our blessing to two very important people in our congregation today. Uh, Mike and Pat. I'm just going to say your last name. You know the way it's saying. Mike and Pat. Mike. Come on forward. So, gosh, you too, Mike. So, how long have you been members of this church? When Mike asked Pat to come up, searching, searching for you. For you. Because that's what I was coming up as a member. Okay, so anyone who didn't hear that joining us online, uh, Pat became an official member of the church when uh, Mike asked him, like, Swinga, uh, to be part of the search committee, which I had no idea he hadn't been a member until then. I thought he'd been around a long time. But anyway, so she became an official member at that point. But, uh, and, and my, oh my gosh, it goes way back to your childhood, right? I can remember March 13, 1957. March 13, 1957. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Okay, so in any case, they have both been part of our congregation for a long time. Pat, along with Ted R. and others, uh, were part of the search committee and was one of the first people that I met, actually, in this congregation. And so I've always kind of felt a, a special connection with Pat because of that. Uh, people on a search committee, they give a candidate their first experience of what the congregation is like. And Pat was very warm and welcoming and interested to learn more about me and she just made me feel right at home and that was really special and uh mike has well first let me also say that in addition to being on the search committee pat has many years of taking superb minutes as church council recording secretary in fact when she needed to step back from that because she needed to um attend to her mom whose health was uh, going downhill and had to be in a place in Connecticut and Danbury, everyone was like, oh, how is that going to work? Because we really rely on her spectacularly. Oh, uh, and you're on the church and all the time you can always count on Mike to have knowledge of how the building operates to know people to call for whatever it was that might be going sideways needed some fixing and he was also the one God bless him who understood my concern about not having sufficient air conditioning at uh, uh, Crawford House which is where I live and together we found a solution that could work out with the resources that the church had, and that was just spectacular. Because I know not everybody feels the same way the two of us do about air conditioning. Some people think it's totally unnecessary because they deal with heat way better than I do. But anyhow, both of these two wonderful human beings have offered so much to our congregation over the years. Countless, countless hours of volunteer time, of dedication, of energy, of hard work, of knowledge and expertise, we have been blessed to have them in our congregation for sure. Let's give them a big round of applause.
as a whole, um, when people such as yourselves, but especially the two of you, when you move away. And, and we know that this is this is the right thing for the next part of your journey. Absolutely. But at the same time, it's, it's slightly bittersweet for us. We're thrilled for where we've got a new home. It's going to be a lovely location and a great new future ahead. But we'll also really miss you. So just know that too. Very, very sweet, but it's something that we want to do. It's the most part of our life. It feels important to our mission. So, everyone, please. From your gate out there, it's not standing there. It's not So, whoever would like to pose and take over the responsibility. <laughs> To Delaware or to say where? Uh, Southern Delaware, Lowell Beach, Lewis area. Probably. We have friends there, but it's at Lowell Beach. It will be 15 minutes to five different places. Wow. Wow. So, it's a whole different area. Maybe you feel like they're on vacation yeah. the whole time. A lot of traffic this time of year in yeah. July and August. Uh, there's a lot of Certainly, the beauty of Delaware would be the most Delaware thing. I'm from Valley. I live so distant from Valley. I saw that yesterday when it came back yesterday. Yeah, it was like, wow. Look at that. Look how beautiful the bridge. What we came from was kind of like traffic. It is in season. Yes. You know, but still, it's all the way through. And we're going to miss what lunches that we have. I was afraid I would always feel very foolish that I was going to come to the Reverend Dr. Oh, yes. He was going to be the same with the name of the true ministry. So I'm very, very close to him. But, Jude, do you know? No. I'm going to my book. And if you find yourself in the area that you would like to view this village here, it's not like you know, it's not like across the ocean or something. We'll be coming up occasionally, and if it's on the weekend, we'll come to service and see everybody. So, Oh, all right. Now, here's the thing, though. Something really important to know. Two people put up the tree who are now no longer going to be with us. And that's one of them. Gene Sheldon's and the other, Mike White. So we're going to need to find new people to put up the Christmas tree. That's all I can say. Um, and their absence will be keenly felt until we figure that out. Um, Show people where the trees and where the decorations are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll figure it out. Sure. Right. But anyway, before they go, I oh gosh, all right. So Joe, you're not the only person that I messed up by forgetting my scripture this morning. I forgot to bring a gift with me this morning. Oh, yeah. It's in my office. It's okay. We'll get it to him. <laughs> but in the meantime, I am going to invite everybody who is here and everybody online. If you could just hold up your hands and let them go in this direction, and we're going to offer a prayer of blessing for the two of them. Holy and loving God, it is always hard to say goodbye to two wonderful people like Matt and Pat, who have been such an integral part of this congregation for so many years and who have poured out their lives and their hearts and service, not only to this congregation, but to the wider community. And so we ask that you, in fact, pour out your blessing upon them, that you help them to feel a sense of ease and peace about this move that they are making, 
that you help them to know that they are not going to be forgotten by us, that they always have a welcome place at your table here in this congregation, but also help them to find a place they can call a spiritual home closer to their new home. May this move come with as few uh, in, uh, sideways things and unexpected uh, wrinkles as possible. May they know that they go with our love and our wishes for a very good and wonderful next chapter in their lives. And above all, may they know that your love and your peace, which surpasses all understanding, is with them at all times. God, in Jesus' name we pray. So I'm not going to really say a whole lot for announcements uh, because uh, we are had a little extra long service today. That's okay, but suffice it to say, you need to read your e news, please, <laughs> or add your bulletin. Uh, but one important thing I want to call your attention to, and that is that I'm going to be on vacation starting this Tuesday, um, August 9th through Tuesday, August 23rd. I neglected in the news to get the phone numbers for our two people who are providing emergency pastoral care coverage. Um, or no, I got it in the e-news, I neglected to get it in the bulletin. That's what it was. So... If you have any pastoral care emergencies that arise while I'm away, Reverend Chris is going to cover August 9th through 14th, and Reverend Linda Barnes will cover August 15th through the 23rd. Their phone numbers are in the e-news. Please don't hesitate to reach out to them. Next week, you get to hear the word preached by our very own Reverend Chris Boyd, and then the following week, our very own Reverend Carol Bohalter. So it's going to be, uh, we're in very good hands while I'm on vacation, and I uh, trust that all will be well. Other announcements, please, please, please read and retain. Anything else that is urgent needs to be said before we move on. Our closing hymn. I know we've sung it a fair amount this summer, but you know what? It's always appropriate when we're saying uh, via convivos to some people that we love. And that is uh, God be with you to the need again. And we're going to be, as it says in the bulletin, doing uh, the first uh, three verses of God be with you and God be with you. Oh, <laughs> 
beloved people, you are fully empowered to discover goodness that surrounds you. God is at work in your life and in the life of every person that you meet. There is enough. You are enough. And together, we can heal our hurting world. And the blessing of the earth maker, the pain bearer, and the life giver will with you this day and always. Amen. Thank you.